Open with me to Ephesians chapter 2, please. Ephesians chapter 2. This morning we have the humbling task of examining one of the most beautiful and profound sections of Scripture relative to your salvation and mine. Have you ever wondered why? We know how God has saved us through the blood of His only begotten Son, which we contacted at the point of baptism, according to passages like Acts 2.38, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, Acts 22.16, and so on. But why? God, why would you choose to even make that available for me? Why would you want to save me? Why? And we will see the answer to that amazing question in Ephesians chapter 2. We have already in our previous studies of the book of Ephesians seen that the book of Ephesians really emphasizes who we are and the fact that we are all together. If I were to maybe try and summarize the book in two words, it would be those two. The first one, identity, who I am as God's child. And the second one is community, who we are together. And Paul will emphasize that in the book of Ephesians over and over and over again. Last month, as we returned to this amazing epistle, we looked at a story of motivation. You see, this epistle is our story. This is who we are. And we looked at from Ephesians 1 verses 15 through 23, a motivation that will help us to stick with the Christian life. This is who God says I am, and that motivates me to be that person. Today, I want to share with you a story of salvation from Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. As we do, we'll notice three observations. Number one, from Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, I want to show you who we were. It seems kind of like a downer, doesn't it, to be reminded of the people that we were before we became Christians, and yet Paul in the epistle to the Ephesians will remind them of this over and over and over. In Ephesians 2 verse 1 he says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. Verse 11 of chapter 2 he says, therefore remember. Verse 12 he says, remember. But then in verse 19 he says, you are no longer strangers and aliens. But don't you see how even in that positive statement there is sort of a nod toward who we used to be. Now by contrast, even in our text of chapter 2 verses 1 through 10, he's going to emphasize who we are, identity, who we are now that God in Christ has saved us. And he will continue to emphasize that. In fact, down in verse 13 of the same chapter, he says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So in verses 1 through 3, Paul shares who we were. And in a word, we were dead. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Let's summarize with a few observations about what this text is actually teaching us. In the first place, we see this idea of death and we see death because of our trespasses and sins. Now, note what, what it is that Paul's saying here. We're talking about a death that is of a spiritual nature. This is a life without God. And by the way, if you look carefully at what it is that Paul's saying, he's essentially telling us that life without God is meaningless. It is a life that is not worth living without God. You were dead. How? In now wait a minute, all throughout the book of Ephesians, Paul's going to use a, a vital prepositional phrase, in Christ. 
You're in Christ. That is a, is a wonderful summary of our identity. Who are we? I am in Christ. And as a result of that, I get all the rights and privileges thereunto. But by contrast to being in Christ, Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 1 that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. The two terms are virtually synonymous. I mean, for all intents and purposes, a trespass is a sin and a sin is a trespass. But technically speaking, we could define the term trespass as an offense. When I trespassed, I offended specifically God. My trespasses offend God. And there's a sense in which I also offend myself. In 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 6, Paul reminds us that when I sin against my body, I sin against myself. But ultimately, I sin against God. Psalm 51, against you and you alone have I sinned. The term sins, the second term that's used here in Ephesians 2.1, is that term that means to miss the mark. And so God has given us the standard. God has essentially given us the target or the bullseye. And when we sin, we miss that target. We miss that standard. And we can do that in at least two ways. First, we can come up short. We can shoot but not get to the target. And other times we can go beyond what it is that God has said. And in either of those instances, we have committed what Paul says is this second term, sins. We were dead when we offended God. We were dead when we went beyond or came up short from God's standard, sin. But the second word as we keep reading is the term society. Because in our trespasses and our sins, what we were doing, verse 2, was walking, indicating a way of life, walking according to the course of this world. That term course is a Greek term that in other passages is translated age. In fact, you'll see that if you back up in Ephesians chapter 1 to verse 21. That Jesus has been placed far above all rule and authority and power and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one that is to come. All right, he uses the same Greek term in this text. You were dead in your trespasses and sins because you were following this age culture. Is this relevant today? I mean, we get so caught up in what's going on around us, the physical, that we lose the above the sun perspective. We lose the idea that there is something greater than what we see around us. There's got to be something more than this, right? The age of this world. This is a culture that dishonors God. Galatians 1 verse 4 says that Jesus came and he died to redeem us from this present evil age. The same Greek term, age, that is translated course in the ESV here. Notice as well that Paul will refer to the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, the air, again referencing the moral atmosphere of our society. Who were we? We were dead. Why? In the trespasses and sins that we committed. I can't blame the society on what I've done, but what I've done is I've lived in a society that influenced me to the point that now I have offended God and come up short or gone beyond what His standard actually teaches. And when I did that, well, I was following Satan. Look carefully at verses 2 and 3 again. In which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Prince, the prince of the power of the air. Colossians 1.13 says that we have been redeemed or translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. There's a kingdom of darkness that is an opposing force to the kingdom that Christ came to establish and over which Christ now reigns as king. And officiating over the kingdom of darkness is this one who in Ephesians 2.2 is described as the prince of the power of the air. 
Jesus will refer to Satan as such in John chapter 14, verse 30, John chapter 16, verse 11. Both of those passages are passages that refer to Satan as the one who is the ruler of this age. And there's even a passage of scriptures that says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. A few years ago, there was a news story out in California. There was a mountain lion that had roamed into town, and it was walking around a school campus. Outside, of course. And what was amazing was, it wasn't so amazing, but for the sake of illustration, humor me. What was amazing was there was nobody out there wandering around when they knew that lion was there. There was helicopter footage that was zooming in, following it as it meandered through playgrounds and then jumped over fences into people's backyards and went throughout the neighborhood. And there was not a soul in sight. Why? Because there's a lion outside. I'm not going out there. But we do it all the time with the spiritual equivalent, don't we? We play with fire. We get too close. We're not watching out. We're not sober. We're not vigilant. And the result is you were dead in the trespasses and sins that you, you, that you got into following the society that is ruled by Satan. And there's a summary term that really encapsulates these three. And the word is self. When I live for me, then I can justify just about anything. Look at what he says there in verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There's nothing wrong with being passionate about something, is there? It's good to be passionate, to, to, to have convictions and beliefs and to stand on those and act on those when those are challenged. That's a wonderful thing to do. There's nothing inherently wrong with having desires. You know, when we leave here, I will desire to eat food. And there is nothing wrong with that. In fact, God made me that way. I have to keep that in check and I don't do as great a job at that as I should. But there's nothing inherently wrong with that desire. You see, the problem is when I let those passions and desires run amok. The issue with passions and desires is I can take legitimate human needs that are then distorted and subverted and heightened to produce an irrational self sitterness And Paul will elaborate on that when we get down, down, down into chapter 4. What, what's happening here? Before we became Christians, here's who we were. We offended God and we missed His mark. We followed a society that is characterized by offending God and missing His mark, that is ruled by the one who is our adversary, Satan, the one who is our enemy, the one who is our slanderer. And we did all of it because what we really wanted is to satisfy self more than anyone else. Who we were dead. But it gets better. <laughs> In verses 4 through 7, by contrast, look at this. Paul describes who God is. In a word, God is gracious. But God, perhaps two of the most profound words in all of Scripture. I mean, you, you see what it is that's stacked against us on one side of this in verses 1 through 3, and then we come over here in verse 4, and he says, but God, but God being rich, abundant, wealth, inexhaustible, rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." Three words summarize who God is, at least as it's revealed in this text. First of all, there's the word mercy. God who is rich in mercy. 
You know, sometimes we have, in a summary fashion, defined the term mercy as when God does not give us what we do deserve. God does not punish us even though we deserve that punishment, mercy. A little more technically stated, this idea of mercy has to do with taking away the consequences of wrongdoing for the offender. And that's motivated by pity and compassion. This is who God is. God is rich in mercy. His mercy is inexhaustible. His mercy is abundant. And sometimes we don't acknowledge that fact. I'm not saying let's extend God's mercy beyond the bounds of Scripture. What I am saying is let's uphold that God's mercy is certainly within the bounds of Scripture. And far too often we try and make the circle smaller. Far too often we try and make folks feel worse about their, about their position in life. Listen, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 is in the Bible and we ought to know it. We ought to feel the weight of our sins, but we also ought to feel the relief that comes with God's mercy. The second word is the word love. God, who is rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. All right, in mercy, God is rich. God's love toward us is great. Great. Love is active goodwill that seeks, the mo uh, seeks to meet the needs of its object. And please observe that God has acted for our good in spite of what it cost him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Love. The third word that describes God, to pick it up we need to come down to the end of verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness. Kindness. This describes God's reaction to the sinner. How has God treated me? Just a minute ago Andrew led us before Romans chapter 5. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Uh, Maybe someone would even dare to die for an individual who is fairly good. But God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's reaction to us in sin as we come to him in penitence is kindness. He's kind to us. And a little later in chapter 4, Paul will say, that's how you're supposed to be to each other. Be kind to one another tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4.32. These three words can be summarized in one word. And it's the word that I skipped. Grace. If mercy is when God does not give us what we do deserve, grace is when God does give us what we do not deserve. God gives us something that we do not deserve, and that is this term, grace. It is by grace that you have been saved. Undeserved blessing that relieves the guilt of sin and pardons the sinner. But notice that it's God's mercy, God's love, and God's kindness that all three work together to produce what we call God's grace. And it's God's grace that has worked to save us. Now, that's who God is. But you know, who God is is really an incomplete picture if we only talk about His characteristics. We also have to come around on the other side and see God's actions that further corroborate what the Bible reveals to us about His very nature. And we see that in this text as well. Because God is merciful, rich in mercy. Because God is loving, His love is great, mega, it's huge. Because God has reacted to us in kindness, and these three things forming the concept of God's grace, then observe how it is that God has treated us. Back up to verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when, 
We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Back up and look at the description of Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 3. And even when that was happening, here's what God did. First, God made us alive together with Christ. We were dead. That's the description in Ephesians 2, 1. But now in Christ and with Christ, in fact together with Christ, we are, according to verse 5, made alive. Now notice this life does not exist apart from Jesus. We are made alive together with Christ. So Jesus' resurrection impacts me. And when I go down under that water of baptism and I'm buried under that water, And then I come up out of that water to walk in newness of life. What I'm doing is I'm uniting myself with Jesus' death, with Jesus' burial, with Jesus' resurrection. And as a result of that, I have the hope of eternal life that His very resurrection secured for me. And all that happens when I submit to Him in baptism. I was dead. And because of God in His graciousness, I have been made alive. But it doesn't stop there. God just piles on His blessings. You've been made alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Him, Jesus. We are raised up with Him. And He has seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Alive, raised, seated. You know, to Jesus has been given a name that is above every name. We read a little bit of that backing up in Ephesians 1, verses 21 to 23. Paul elaborates on that in Philippians 2, when he says that God has given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess, Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. And while we will never be Jesus, there is a sense in which we share in His glory. I can't explain it fully because it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That is, why God would want me, why He would take me and elevate me, not that I'm better than anyone else, I'm just saved. Whatever status I have is in Jesus, it's not on my own. Notice the prepositional phrase that's scattered throughout this text. Verse 5, you've made alive together with Christ. Verse 6, we're raised up with Him. Verse 6, we're seated with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That last prepositional phrase, in Christ Jesus, modifies all three of the verbs that preceded it. Alive, made us alive, raised us, seated us. But here I am with Jesus. And this is who I am because of who God is. Why? God, why? I I understand how, through Jesus, that I contact in baptism. But why? Can I show you God's answer to that in Ephesians 2 verse 7? Why has God saved you? Look at it. So That, here's a statement of purpose. In the coming ages, wait a minute, back up to verse 2, we were following the course of this world. We said that word course meant age, the present age. Here Paul uses the same Greek term age, and he says in the future, in the coming ages, that's all future times, He, God, might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Wait a minute. Why did God save you? So that from now until extending as far into eternity as anyone can possibly go, you will forever be a monument of God's grace and God's kindness and God's love and God's mercy. Paul says, in summary, if God can save me, God can save anybody. Paul says, I am an example 
God used me as an example to demonstrate His graciousness that He will extend to anyone. And listen, I'm here to tell you this morning that Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7 teaches that you are a monument to God's gracious kindness, loving, mercy, salvation. You are a monument to that. That's why you are saved. Not to demonstrate how worthy you were all along. Not to flaunt it in front of somebody else how much better you are because you're religious and they're worldly. But to show how great God is. That's why you're saved. Such is too high for me. That's who God is. In the third place this morning and finally. God has shown us in this text who we were. And who God is. But now, let's look at who we are. And in a word, I think the summary is, I, we, are His. We're His. Verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is an amazing contrast. You know, earlier, backing up in verse 3, Paul says that when we followed the desires of the body and of the mind, that we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. He's talking about our character. And this is a character that we've acquired not by birth, but by just habitual practice. You know, it's not that I was born in sin. No. Instead, by my continuing in a sinful activity, this became who I was. I was dead. But now God has intervened through His grace, through His mercy, love, and kindness, and made it possible for me to become His. And so no longer am I a part of the sons of disobedience, as He referenced in verses 1 through 3, but now I'm a part of the children of God. So let's dig into verses 8 through 10. And again, we see several points of emphasis. By grace you have been saved. Notice, First, there is a cause. The cause of my salvation is God's grace. How is it possible for me to be saved? Because God is gracious. And in behind that word grace, as we've already noticed, are those three concepts of mercy, love, and kindness. So God, because of who He is, has demonstrated who He is in His actions and made it possible for us to say in Ephesians 2 verse 8, for by grace you have been saved. By grace, that's the cause. By grace. But then there's a condition. By grace you have been saved through faith. Faith becomes the channel through which I receive the blessings of God's grace. Salvation is caused by God because of who He is. And the way that I reach up to receive His gift, if salvation is a gift, that demands both a giver and a recipient, doesn't it? Is it a gift if nobody ever receives it? So somebody has to receive it. Well, how do you receive it? Through faith. Faith, of course, is conviction enacted. I demonstrate my faith by my works. Seemed like I read that somewhere. James chapter 2. And so if I really believe that the Word of God is true, and if I'm really willing to obey it, then I reach up in faith to receive the blessings of God's grace. Faith becomes the action demonstrated the active demonstration of firm belief expressed in conviction. By grace you've been saved through faith. Notice, this is a gift from our loving Father. But then, he continues, not only are we saved, but being saved by God redefines who we are. <laughs> 
By grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's not a result of work so that no one may boast. This is a gift from our loving Father to us that we receive through the conditional channel of faith. And then verse 10, for we are his workmanship. The term means a product, something that he made. If you go forward in Ephesians 4 and look at verse 24, you kind of get the idea of this. We're to put on the new self created after the likeness of God. Created. All right, and so here we have this idea of here's the creation. It's us, and we are his product. We are his workmanship. This is who I am. Now, what am I supposed to do now that I'm the product of God in Christ? Created, we're his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. There's my purpose. For good works. I'm saved to serve. And because I serve him, I am his, Romans chapter 6 says, bond servant. The term literally means slave. And while that general notion may not be politically correct, it is theologically accurate. This is who I am. I am God's slave. I'm his. Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Paul says to the church at Corinth. And then he continues in another passage, For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Possess it. G-O-D apostrophe S. They belong to Him. This is who I am. I'm created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good, doing good works. And then look at how Paul caps this off. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, previously, according to chapter 2, verse 2, I walked following the society. The moral air surrounding me. That, that, that was what I was all about. But now in Christ, I belong to God. I'm His. And my path has changed. No longer am I walking according to societal norms and standards. Instead, this is my path. I walk according to good works. Salvation is a gift from our loving Father. And as I continue forward in serving Him and walking this path, I render back praise to our worthy Father as a monument of His grace and kindness and love and mercy demonstrating to everyone how great is our God. This is our story. It's a beautiful story. It's a story of salvation that confirms not only who we are as a community, but our very identity. We're His. This morning... I have just attempted to preach to you from one of the most beautiful passages on salvation that exists. One of the greatest summaries of what it means to be a Christian as we're reminded of who we used to be and by God's grace, who we are. And if those blessings, if that grace has not been applied to your soul, let's talk. Let me share with you the details behind the truthful statements that Paul has given to us in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Let's talk about the blessing of baptism that comes as a result of your faith in Jesus, your willingness to turn away from sins, to confess his wonderful name, and to die with him so that you can rise with him to walk in newness of life. Are you ready? If you're ready for that, we'd love to assist you today. In fact, right now. If this morning as a Christian you need prayers from this wonderful church family, a people who have been saved not by our own merit, but because that's the kind of God that we serve, we would love to take you before his awesome throne today. Come forward if you have a need while we stand and sing.